The year is 1912. Two young writers, Matthew Donald and Matthew David, board a great ship full of aspiring writers called the Wright Tannic. They meet, exchange their story ideas, and form a powerful, loving friendship. Nothing gay or anything, though. All right, we're totally straight. I mean, um, they are totally straight. Anyways, all seemed well aboard the luxurious, unsinkable ship. Until tragedy struck. And then an iceberg. You see, an iceberg struck the Titanic. Get it? <laughs> and so, as the once proud ocean liner plunged into the frigid depths, Matthew Donald and Matthew David floated on a very large, very buoyant piece of wood. Yet due to their, <clears throat> shall we say, uh curvaceous frames, the wood started to sink. One of these young writers would have to say goodbye. <sighs> oh god. Oh god. It's cold. Whose bright idea was it to send a cruise liner to the North Atlantic? Probably the same guy who said the ship was unsinkable and yet it sunk! That's false advertising, I tell you. I... I don't think this plank of wood can hold both of us, David. I'm, I'm gonna go down. Wait, sh sh shouldn't we talk about this? N no, I I've made up my mind. You told me your stories and and your ideas for future works. You've, you've got a great future ahead of you, David. I've finished my life's work. The, 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 the dinosaurs with the laser guns story? No, that's not your life's work, Donald. I refuse to let you be a single idea writer. I'm going to take the plunge, not you. We're not talking about this, David. I'm going. I've done everything I possibly could. Didn't you hear me shout about being king of the world? How much more could I be? The emperor. But you've got other ideas, Donald. You're, you're, you're more than just d d dinosaurs with the laser guns. And you've already started working on your other ideas. And you've got plans with, for more. And more. And more. I'm not letting you give those up, David. Donald, I... I... I can't. No. Don't say your goodbyes, David. Don't you give up. Don't do it. But I'm so cold. You're gonna get out of this. You're, you're gonna go on and you're gonna write stories and watch them develop. And, and you're gonna die an old, successful author. Warm in your piles of money. Not here. Not this night. Do you understand me? I can't feel anything. It's too, too, too freaking cold. David. Listen to me. Getting aboard the right Titanic was the best thing that could ever happen to me. It allowed me to hear your writing ideas. And I'm thankful, David. I'm thankful. You must do me this honor, David. Because that's totally how I phrase things. Promise me you will survive. That you will never give up on your writing career. No matter what happens. Promise me now, and never let go of that promise. I, 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 I promise. Never let go. I'll never let go, Donald. I'll never let go. Okay, I'm going to let go of you now. Wait, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. <laughs> Donald, I'll never forget your ideas. I I I'll tell your s silly dinosaur laser gun garbage to everyone. But I will also heed your promise and write all of my ideas about superheroes and silly things like that. Good tribe, whatever I type, I believe that the pandas go on. Great shot. <laughs>
Whatever I write, I believe that the pen will go on. My pen always will go on. Welcome, fellow nerds, to another episode of The Ritwit, the only show brave enough to ask to barely published, barely professional writers what they've ripped off when writing their stuff. I mean, not this episode, you know, because of the way we format these sets, but next episode we'll do it again. Right, of course, absolutely. <laughs> ah, yes, it's, it's good to be back here at the right win, and oh, oh, oh no. Hold on, I'm, I'm, it's, it's weird, I feel like an old, an old version of me is just, a, a past version of me just died. Huh. If it's a past ah, so version pump, of you... It may be just gas, so let's move on. <laughs> if it's a past version of you, it would already be dead. That's sound logic. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something we're so weird? good at dispensing out on the Ritwit, aren't we? <laughs> Anyways. Wouldn't that be weird if you re if you die and then you reincarnate, but when you reincarnate, it's actually a little bit before your previous version has still has died? <laughs> Let's see if any uh, beliefs, like any religious beliefs, is like how many other that. religious that, beliefs can happen? we? How many other religious know beliefs it, can we offend? <laughs> this joke. I know in Hinduism, you get reincarnated as whatever creature like is higher up based on how good you were in life. If you're a bad person, you're reincarnated as a slug. If you're a good person, you're reincarnated as like an eagle or something. I don't know exactly. Which what means it is, that but. slugs generally get reincarnated as something better because they can't really do much. I think you can even get reincarnated as a rock, too, if you're really bad. <laughs> and you never get but, reincarnated after being a rock almost ever again. Yep. Anyway, yep. sounds about well, right. Well, that's your faith, unfortunately. How uh, okay. many Sorry, other apologies. religious faiths can we offend in one opening Apologies segment. to any Hindu re listeners who have completely botched their religion. Just know... Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't know enough. We shouldn't be talking about it. Anyway, right. so we've had this set recently about awesome characters, and as you can see from the title of this one, we are talking about characters who defy definition, and they're therefore are awesome anti-heroes. <laughs> That's one way to force, force that, that awesome thing into this podcast. Oh, they are really awesome. Well, really I like mean, that was your idea. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm kidding. Was I, it? I, oh, yeah, it the, was. The well, <laughs> well, the awesome theme, tying them all together was your idea, but I was the one who made uh, that description. But anyway, for uh, the okay. final in this okay. set, we're talking about those straddlers. Not on a horse, not from the Old West. But of the morality line. S save a horse, ride a, ride a anti-hero? <laughs> that sounds dirty. Okay. What? What constitutes an anti-hero and why have they achieved such crazy popularity? Go, Oh, Donald. why have they? I will never know. Oh, wait, I have something to say. Standard heroes are brave, compassionate, loyal, just, and honest. Anti-heroes are some or none of these things. <laughs> Only some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have the capability of lying, cheating, stealing, and other morally questionable things as any villain. But they also know when to relent to the goody-goody stuff and do the right thing. Like, they're slicker, they're edgier, they're more unpredictable than the standard hero. Which makes them loads more interesting to most people. There, there's a reason why Batman is far more popular than Superman. <laughs> so. I... I think it depends on who you'd ask, but yeah, they're definitely one, two in terms of popularity. Like there was something on uh, IGN as a site I frequent, and they just recently republished a top 25 DC heroes, uh, and Superman was actually number one. I, guess I knew it was going to be Superman he, he or the... Batman, but... Wouldn't that be funny which? if it was like, it was like Martian Manhunter or Martian... something? <laughs> Well, well, and here's the thing: Martian Manhunter is like Superman with a tragic, with an even more tragic backstory, <laughs> and more things to overcome, and basically the same power set. So it wouldn't actually be that hard to believe. He's just not. Okay, that what's another one? Prominent. It's Blue Beetle. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be no Booster Gold. That would be freaking insane. <laughs> The Atom. <laughs> the Atom. Okay. Actually, I like the Atom. But anyway, uh, He's like enough, Ant -Man, about, but... enough about DC or Marvel heroes. They're, every character is somebody's favorite. But yes, these anti-hero types tend to be much more popular. I guess the reason I would say is because they're more human than perfect heroes. Right. Like, they have a questionable, questionable commitment to the polar north morality of the, uh, what is it, the, the perfect Boy Scout 
archetype right. we talked about. Right. You know, uh, they're capable of more jaw dropping stuff because they know little restraint. They don't care to restrain themselves, so they will freely do things that just make you go, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that kind of a thing. Uh, right. They remind well, like, audience. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say. Well, it's funny because, like, with char- these characters being popular, from the people uh, that I know of, that I know personally who have read Megazoic, guess who the most popular character is? Anra. Exactly. It's freaking Anra. <laughs> she, she's. I, I do like Anra, but there yeah, are other good characters in that story, the... too. Bitch, by the she way, if the... you're curious about what we're talking about, listeners, you can buy all of the books of Megazoic, including the most recently released, last one, on Amazon.com for print and Kindle. So please, please support Matthew Donald's hard work over there. But yeah, no, see, Anra's the anti hero, and I worked with this narratively. Because she was so popular. I actually kept her from being... She wasn't in uh, the second book, a primeval, The Primeval Power, except for one scene. She was absent from it. That made her return all the sweeter in the third book, so that's, well, I did that thing, on purpose. I'm, you're talking about your dinosaurs with laser guns books, so I'm going to talk about something near and dear to my heart. With Power Rangers, yes. when they brought... Ah, yes. When they went from the green transitioning to the white ranger in season two... Right. That they removed Tommy who was the very, very, very popular Green Ranger character. And right. they wanted, and originally the producers wanted to actually put somebody else in, but they figured out the fans, when when Tommy left the show for that brief amount of time, not only did the actor want to come back and do it really bad, but the fans were clamoring for him to be back in. Right, And exactly. so eventually, you know, fate accompli, they made him the White Ranger. But when right, he finally right. comes back with power, it's so rewarding Right, exactly. Because to that point, to that point, afterwards is a different story. But to that point, he had not been overexposed. Yes. Which also has to do with the way they handled the Green Ranger to begin with. Something you mentioned, and we actually talked about this in episode 49 about badasses, characters who act awesome. Or was it do awesome? Characters act awesome. I think Excuse me. One you of the two. It. You changed it. Anyway, ding. Um. <laughs> mostly for the title not the reference the number is correct right but anyway right. <laughs> um you know not overexposing these characters means that they're more fun right exactly so that's well, kind of what you were tr- hoping to do with onro and i was yeah. really mad that she wasn't really in primeval power at all but you made up for it by having her come back again and and i made her come back in a real role. natural way i like to think like they needed her expertise so anyways not never yeah. had to get too into it so no, we're not at this point, but um, this is something that I, I believe they're very popular because they remind audiences that the world isn't simply binary, black, white, good, evil. Right, right, exactly. They seem cool by comparison to these other stuffier heroes who are always <laughs> goody-goody two-shoes, and they're exciting because you can't quite guarantee his or her next actions. You can right, guess, right, yeah. and you might be right, they might exhibit a pattern, but they're far less predictable. Right, exactly. Doesn't mean they aren't predictable, just that they're less predictable. Right. <laughs> so, there's right. that. Uh, obviously, anti-heroes, uh, as a concept, are far more recent. Like, obviously, Batman, and we talk about it as a major anti-hero, but really... It's not that cut and dry that he's not always been an anti-hero. They published him as straight hero, less heroic, straight detective, and then finally got to this dark, brooding, edgy, anti-hero-esque portrayal over you know a longer period of time. Right, but, but and even then, like, he's not necessarily like the cl- typical anti-hero. No, he's, he's not. Very, very just no. and moral. Sorry, the one I'm going to say before you get to say anything else: Deadpool. I was going to say Deadpool. <laughs> Which is why I said it before you said anything else. Because you brought up all the other examples in this set, and I haven't brought up my own genuine ones yet. Anyway, Deadpool. Okay, you got more? Uh, well, maybe in a bit, but I wanted to talk about Deadpool first. Okay. Deadpool hits, Deadpool hits the scene and pretty much immediately gets all of this recognition because he's this loudmouth character with irreverent sense of humor, fourth wall breaking antics. And, you know, he is a very interesting character, not age appropriate, <laughs> to, but a very put interesting character. Um, I still think they could make Deadpool work. And like, if they bring him in an Avengers movie as one scene, 
and it's PG-13, and he starts swearing, and it gets beeped out, and then he acknowledges that it gets beeped out, and he's like, F you, Disney, <laughs> or something like that. They something, could make it work. I, you, know, you know the thing to be really hilarious? Is yeah. if Deadpool walks on screen and they constantly have a black bar in front of his mouth so he can't say anything. Yeah, <laughs> and like oh, but leaving, then you're doing the like, sewing his mouth like, shut in a way. And, and <laughs> like, like and like as he's leaving the scene, he drops the he drops the black box and says, "You know what? Screw you, Disney. I'm out of here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like they could make that work. They shouldn't do it for the whole movie, but they could have no, a scene. No, well, you can't overexpose him because you know too much Deadpool is a bad thing. Just like yeah, you know, too much like, of a good thing. Just, is just like the Green Ranger um, or Onra. Yeah. Well, and the other the other one that comes to mind is also Marvel is Wolverine. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> because Wolverine is unafraid to unsheath his claws on anybody who he deems is worthy of you know getting gutted or being <laughs> eliminated, and yep. he has few qualms, at least most of the time, about doing these things. And he's quite brutal. Like he is. There's a reason Logan is rated R, and it feels very natural for the character. So. Well, and I don't think that, that that superhero movies could it would only work as PG-13 or less. I think there are some that lend themselves to it, and I'm gonna well, say the more the vulgar antiheroes are probably right for that treatment. Well, like the Punisher, that'd be another good R-rated yeah. superhero movie. So you're right. You're right. I really wish we could come up with a good DC example because we've said three Marvel ones now. Well, we got Batman. But well, let's see what Batman, think of again, one. as I said, isn't really has not always been portrayed as the anti-hero such that he got like massive popularity. How about from Martian side. Manhunter? I mean, his name is Manhunter. <laughs> eh, but he's not really an anti-hero. It doesn't uh, work that way. How about way. Jason Todd? Jason Todd, you could argue, but uh, when he was introduced, he was certainly not... Well, no. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd say that's a pretty... That's probably a good... Good one. Okay. Robin number two it is. <laughs> Robin number two, yes. Because obviously Jason had a tra- pretty tragic backstory such that he was very jaded about life even from that age when he met Batman. And Batman was a positive influence but for a very short amount of time and that right. has affected the rest of his portrayal and, you know, becoming yep. anti-hero, extra villain, or even, Red Hood, all yeah, these Yeah, villain, things. Red Hood, or in the video game, the Arkham Knight. Spoiler alert for that. Which, that's, <laughs> that, that's the game. They actually, in the comic, re- introduced a new version of the Arkham Knight character and they didn't make it Jason Todd. That's really neat Ooh, to me. that's cool. Because I like his design. He looks like a like he has a Batman esque mask, but it's more cybernetic. And he doesn't have a cape. Like sure. it's really it's a really cool design. No, I agree with that. But you know, one thing. Um, sorry, this is a tangent. Now I'm going to be done after this, and we'll get that's to the fine. next question. <laughs> but this is why I appreciate media having various formats, having adaptations where they make different right. choices. Because so it, provide, that's, that's it proves cool. that like, there is value in an adaptation. Something that I see a lot in the community of tokusatsu fans is that everybody says, oh, well, obviously Sentai is so much better than Power Rangers, the adaptation. And, I I mean, I can't say objectively one is better than the other. I can say they're different. But like, I can say Power that America, Rangers, yeah. America adds a lot, of, a lot of stuff to differentiate it. But generally, it's like equipment. So... If you're familiar enough with Power Rangers to know the term Battleizer, where the Red Ranger gets a power-up, that was an entirely right. an American invention. Really? Uh, that yes. sounds so Japanese, though. <laughs> well, yes and no. Like, if in Japan, the focus is on wa, which is a word mean, translated to harmony. Right, right, exactly. Within a group, within the unit, rather than sticking out. Whereas America, we want the standouts to stand <laughs> out. Right. So, you know, that's why the Red Ranger, who is always the leader in our accepted canon, is getting the power-ups more what than anybody with, else. With Red being the leader, like in Bionicle, the Red Toa is always usually the leader. Usually, although I'd argue Tahu really isn't compared to the rest of the team, but... Well, I mean, he Vakama is certainly although, is. Although the Jala Toa Nika, Jala thought he was the leader, but it turned out that it was actually Matoro, so... Well, and that's the thing, is what social constructs dictate versus what actually exists don't guarantee the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just so happens that they usually cast this red one to be the leader type. And so the red one gets this extra suit of armor, this extra equipment piece. That's entirely an American invention. Japan actually ended up aping it later. Makes sense. Anyways, we're As talking opposed about to the alternative. I guess we were talking about Jason Todd and then that. It's not too many steps we were here. <laughs> no, sorry, but that but that's the thing. Value in adaptations. 
Well, that's cool that you're like that, though. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it has to follow the comics exactly. That's cool that you're like more lenient. Well, than that. Like, I, I mean, I suppose if, if you describe lenient as if you're going to make a choice, do it from a place of conviction, whether it's making the Arkham Knight a separate identity or whatever it is, have a reason for it. Right. Sorry, I'm going to get off my tangent now. If you that's can make okay. a flaw in your main character, your main one, the titular, the guy you're putting all your effort behind, so in uh, Donald's case, Cortan, do yes. you need <laughs> an anti-hero opposite that dynamic character? I mean, it's not like there's only three tiers of characters, hero, villain, anti-hero. There's a spectrum. There's also a spectrum of qualities to a character with one or more flaws in each of them. All characters should have flaws, but some can have more than others. Sure. If you have some a good two-shoes do. hero... What? <laughs> some naturally do. <laughs> well, yeah. Exactly. Like, if you it's have a good two-shoes hero... It's not a matter of can have. It's not like, oh, I'm going to reward you with five flaws. <laughs> <laughs> What is this, an RPG? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's not. You. It's not a matter of can't have. It's some, it's some do have. Right. Well, it's like, if you have a good E2-Shoes hero alongside a shadier anti-hero, it makes for a good pairing. Sure. It makes it interesting. It's like a, most buddy cop movies are like that. Like, Basically. You yeah, got the straight You have the no-nonsense lo- law fooler, and you have the, the loose cannon, like... Does what he wants, cop. You know, it's always how it is in buddy cop stories, so... Buddy cop stories are such a prominent thing. Anyway, yeah, no. <laughs> like Osmosis Jones and other examples. Uh, Z and Drix, no. <laughs> like, yeah, other like, examples that you will slightly embarrass you to bring up, but go for it. Sydney White's not. Yeah, not for more on that, listen to our last episode, which was about leaders, characters who inspire awesome. That was episode 51, by the way. Ding. Okay, that is it. We've done a lot of dings in these all these recordings. I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> well, actually, we've only had like one per episode so far. No, we've had like couple. three or four for some of them. In, but. in the last couple, it's been awfully. Sh- it's been fewer than before. I do know that. But anyway. Okay. Anyways, but yeah. So, like, of course, no story needs anything really. <laughs> like, a writer can tell what other story they want. However, well, they want. I suppose, I suppose, if we have to talk about a story needing anything, it needs a conflict. It needs a setting. It needs a character plot. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, probably it needs. But those. it doesn't. <laughs> but like, as far as what kind of plot, character, setting, it doesn't have a checklist. You don't have to include any one thing. But like. If you, you want a lot of people to like your stuff, there are some conventions that are good to follow. So. Yeah, well, there, that is true. But you are free to, you know, do what you wish as the writer. It's your story. Right, we're just Tell trying it. to guide you towards, you know. However you feel like telling it is your business. We'll, right. uh, the audience will tell you whether they like it or not. <laughs> Take our advice or don't. That's true of anybody. Exactly. <laughs> so. Sorry. Anyway. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, if there's a flaw in your main character. I, I believe that one flaw does not a complete character make. Right, exactly. But as long as they are as long as this hero isn't perfect enough that there's no growth potential, you don't need an anti hero just to provide more interest to your story. Right. Going back to Sentai, because the Red Rangers are generally cast as these perfect individuals. They always do the right thing. They always know just what to say. They're like renaissance men. Where does a character like that grow? (laughs) Exactly. They can't. (laughs) Like, there's nowhere for them to go. Unless there's other conflict presented in, like, their family history or something that that has to be resolved over the course of the season. But it's just like, there's nowhere for them to go, so why... They're not great characters. Like, I don't mind. They're good fighters right. and they're good people, but they're not good characters. They're pretty static. Right, exactly. Which is, I loathe to admit it. Say, <laughs> so, you know, complete characters, dy- dynamism is a good thing. Uh, said another way, uh, if your main character isn't an anti-hero, having a couple flaws is actually totally natural and much better writing than just putting an anti-hero alongside them to make them look, to give the reader <laughs> a different look on the story you right, know? Right, exactly <laughs> so i mean obviously exactly. with, with sentai being a five-man team generally you have other characters to balance out that perfect red right if they're focused on <laughs> yeah exactly so you know you can't just have this one character be perfect goody two-shoes all the time nowhere to grow because that's not interesting to <clears throat> read about 
Right. That said, you know, if your main character is an anti-hero, that's your business. But, you know, you don't have to make them all the way into an anti-hero if you give them a couple of decent, like, flaws. Something that presents an obstacle, some progression yeah. chance for them. But yeah, let's exactly. be real. The raging popularity of these characters has basically convinced all wannabe authors that no other type should lead a tale anyway, so why are we worried about it? Yeah, just make everyone anti-hero. <laughs> yeah, make everyone human. What a thought. Dinosaur make every, boy. Make everyone an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> How many assholes we got in this ship anyhow? Yo! Yo! <laughs> uh, I knew it. For more on that, that, please watch Spaceballs. <laughs> yes. Also, not a family-friendly movie, but a fun reference. Anyway, so it's uh, by some miracle it's rated PG. But that was back when that was back P- when the MPAA was probably way less, you know, figured out in their ratings. But that was back when the PG rating actually meant something. So. <laughs> that was back when PG actually was recommended, as opposed to just a, oh, kid-friendly. <laughs> Yeah, but it means parental guidance suggested. That's literally what PG That's, means. Right? Well, it should be PGS if you're saying suggested. But yeah, it was included there. So next question about anti-heroes. How do you redeem or maybe damn these characters so that they don't completely walk foot in both camps? Right. That they're well, bordering method, good and evil all the time, you know? Right. Well, like one method that I like. Sorry. Like, one method is to give them a line that they'll never cross, even with all the other things they'll do. Like, for instance, obviously, Batman traditionally never takes a life. For if he does, he feels like he will fall down the slippery slope and become just as insane as his rogues gallery. I so. seem to remember that some people have interpreted that as he is he is unwilling to use guns, of course, depending on the author. That's, sometimes he's that way, too. It's like he, like... So, I mean, it, it, there's, there's a, a line in the sand that they will not cross. Of course, there are some time, uh, some annotations where he has freaking machine guns on the Batmobile, so take yeah, it what you will. Well, okay, that's the Batmobile, and it's probably for crowd control <laughs> on the tanks that are opposed. Don't him, worry, but... they're non-lethal bullets. No, so... non-lethal guns, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the um, sorry, not getting into, like, politic-type things on gun control, but, you know, guns don't kill people, people do. <laughs> guns don't kill people, the Batmobile does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, That's what sorry. Batman's defense whenever he just... <laughs> I'm Batman. <laughs> I need to do I'm Batman here. and I didn't kill those people. The Batmobile did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, anyways, anyway, so conversely, you can have a character like clearly detest some of the more schmaltzy stuff that more Paragon type heroes love. Like rolling their eyes at the hero kissing babies or something. <laughs> yeah, there's that. There's a lot of different methods. Be creative. Just make sure the reader can easily define the lines the characters won't cross in one direction or another. Whether that's them saying it or whether that's them showing it by making a choice. Right. And, of course, we have always said show, don't just tell. Or maybe not As most writers should. As most writers should, but not always successfully. (laughs) Um, So, you know, something that I have said in this regard is that I like show show their opinions changing. Yes. Thanks to interactions or plot happenings. You know, if you start neutral, eventually you wind up one way or another, right? Right, right, exactly. Ideally. So a hardened war vet, we mentioned Punisher earlier, so think Frank Castle, for example, probably <laughs> doesn't think about doesn't think twice about shooting people that commit atrocious deeds because they've lived through combat zones where you fight right. to survive. Right, exactly. And this person did a horrible thing. He is my enemy. He's my target. He's going down. I don't care about <laughs> his family. Way I don't care about the aftermath. I don't care if I get incarcerated for it. I'm just doing what needs to be done. You know, right. and that's the justification. If it happens in the story, this plot happening, there's that's a golden opportunity to either solidify their position or alter it and add some development that way. Right. This convinces them that they were right. Or maybe it convinces them that they are wrong and they need to change their mind. Right. More for damning them to be to the evil side as opposed to, you know, redeeming them. A common tactic is the slippery slope stuff. No choice but to kill a kid and suddenly discover Ugh. they have more of a taste for it than they ever oh, God. expected. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Oh, yeah, thing. I love killing kids. I love. Really yeah, we do not endorse that on the Ritwit. Please be I do. Listeners. No, it's, no, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I would bring something up, but I'm not going to. Having some agent, whether it is an item, a character, or an event, is crucial here. Something that right. 
instigates this mm -hmm. in either direction, honestly, but in particular, if you're damning them, if you're turning them into a full on villain, that something needs to happen or right. else they wouldn't be an anti-hero because in the opening of your tale, they would already be a villain, right? Right, exactly. I mean, I guess you could have a story about a villain becoming an anti-hero, but... Well, I suppose there is that, too. Uh, like, for example, the Silver Surfer, who oh, is yeah. not... He was not very uh, understood, and so his motives were kind of questioned, but he did a lot of evil things. And not only when you found out what he was fighting for, did the Fantastic Four try to sympathize with him, and so he became more of this anti-hero type. Right. Because, you know, he represented the, he represented Galactus, who is, of course, not an anti-hero in any way, shape, or form. Nope, he's, <laughs> he's a just guy a who consumes planets. He's just so a glutton. he's all around bad news. So, yeah, there's that. Him and Unicron <laughs> are pen pals, so... Well, yeah, there, there's that, too. <laughs> and also, uh, the Megaxel from an older version of Megazoic you'll never hear about. Which, which nobody will ever read because you didn't publish that one. However, you I don't even think I even version. mentioned the Megaxel when we were doing older, like, what we have once read, so... I don't think we got all that far into the that episode, did we? We, we like went, we didn't we get to that, that version. version of Megazoic. Did we? I don't remember anymore. Yeah, because remember we did the Scrabble counter thing? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Oh, we should really revisit that one of these days. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it next week. Who knows? Maybe we will. Maybe we'll figure it out. Anyway. Um... <laughs> I'm trying to think. I was thinking there's another Fantastic Four villain, though, that kind of fits here. That I, I always it's, think is I hope it's not Dr. Thing. Doom. No, 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 no. Um, although there are times he's portrayed as more, you know, pained villain as opposed to a sympathetic villain as opposed to just a straight up villain but uh, uh, just no i was thinking note, i think that it since disney has bought fox my theory is that they'll introduce the fantastic four at least some of this but like in black panther 2 doom will be the villain or something or at least he'll be mentioned because he's often the black panther villain too right well black panther's also been in the fantastic four so there is that so i think that's what they'll do in black panther 2 they'll mention dr doom or show him or cast Don't him or know. whatever not worried but yeah, it's a theory. <laughs> anyway, and then they'll get the Fantastic Four from it in that way. I don't know. We'll find out. But <laughs> well, I guess we will. Uh, but like, there's there's somebody. It's like same level as Galactus as far as like power, but they don't consume planets because they're not as huge. And I think I'm keep mixing up Annihilus with like maybe the Unicron idea. <laughs> Unicron's Transformers. <laughs> I know Unicron is Transformers. I'm just saying, like, he's... Oh, I always seem to think that he's this massive planet-eating thing, but I know he's not, so it's weird. Anyway. Um... Keeping all these crazy, kooky <laughs> villain names straight is one thing, I'll tell you. What was that Superman one that we mentioned off, like, last Mr. night? Mi Mr. McFlixick or whatever the... <laughs> Mr. McFlix spelled, like, M-X-J or whatever. Yeah, if you... It, well, that'd be, that'd be real high on the Scrabble counter, but if you if you say his name backwards, you make him disappear. <laughs> That's the only way That's to That's a pretty him. easy way to defeat him. <laughs> yeah, so easy. I mean, I guess if his you, name's hard to say, only, so maybe it's harder than only I thought, if but... you Only if you count, like, oh, can I spell it out? Because that's real simple. <laughs> okay, yeah. fun tangent. Fun tangent. There was oh, a guy God, in my go. high school class whose last name had 11 letters, and it was Polish. So, <laughs> like, it was really freaking weird to spell. And... Um, to, for protection of the innocent, I won't use his actual name, but I will tell you <laughs> the one of the things, one of the things that he did was he used the Mickey Mouse March to spell his last name for us. Nice. <laughs> and I still remember it because it was so iconic. That's pretty good. <laughs> it was really brilliant. But I just think wish... like this Superman villain does that, Mr. Miss a little whatever. And he's like, well, if I can spell it, then I can get rid of you really easy. And so I don't think it's that simple. <laughs> Especially if it's the tune in the Mickey Mouse march. <laughs> no, no. He, I think his is more than 11 letters. I'm not checking it right now because I'm not that unprofessional. But anyways, <laughs> uh, well, I am. So no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> You know, I, I wish my, sometimes I wish my last name was more complicated. Like, it's not Donald, by the way. I think I might have mentioned this before, but it's actually Hall. Donald's my middle name, and David is your middle name as well, so. Right. Just It's Matt just the, pe the, the pen name I went for. Matthew yeah. Donald rather than Matt Hall, so. Because I don't know too many authors that have the name Donald. 
Yeah, it's, there fourth. actually is a Matthew Donald that's an author. I found out when trying to put my book in the Library of Congress, which it is in now. So, oh, so, <laughs> so I had to be Matthew Donald number two. <laughs> what? <laughs> but at, he's at only published point, like one thing. It's like a textbook, it, so it's not really that, the same. At that point, I would put like the last name in parentheses <laughs> instead of doing going in as the second. But it's all right. I'm me. used to being number two. <laughs> Oh, trust me, I'm used to being little Matt because there are so many Matts in my life and generally they're older or taller or both than me. Yeah, because I'm so big I'm Matt to your Matt. little siblings. And then exactly. er, like like earlier this year, I found out there's even an even bigger Matt. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All of my life, I have been I have been little Matt. <sighs> but anyways, unless this bigger Matt's an anti-hero, this is, <laughs> this is not... <laughs> All right, quick. One reason to use this archetype and... One reason to avoid it like the plague. Go. Oh, no, you got me on the spot. Ah, ah, ah. No, it's fine. Re <laughs> reason to use anti-heroes. They're fun, interesting, more engaging, and often more relatable than a standard hero. That kind of sounds like more than one reason, but okay. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you crap because mine's probably going to sound about the same, so go ahead. Reason number two not to use them. <laughs> this is my one reason. Number two? They can go too far, and this is still number the same reason. They can seem like they're still trying too hard to be cool. <laughs> and the same reason they might overshadow your other characters that's all one reason but why did you say number two because it's not number two reason not to use them it's the first reason not to use them right? I don't know I'm obsessed with number two uh listeners are missing important context on that <laughs> i don't think they are <laughs> <laughs> oh oh boy what are your reasons <laughs> such children <laughs> I'm turning 28 in a couple of weeks <laughs> you think I could learn <laughs> I am so sorry <sighs> uh, that was a really bad time to take a drink too <laughs> Hope I didn't make it squirt out of your nose. <laughs> no, it didn't come out of my nose, but I couldn't say anything, but I was still laughing anyway. <laughs> uh, we are so mature here on the Ritwit, aren't we, listeners? <laughs> all right, so. Uh, all right, what are your right, reasons? One reason, one, re <laughs> one reason to use the uh, one reason to use the anti-hero. It opens the sandbox for choices and character direction. Yes. Because it obviously enables you to do literally anything you want. Right. Uh, exactly. Reason not to use them, though, it's too easy to abuse for flip-flopping. <laughs> right, exactly. They suddenly have this villainous turn. They suddenly are the goody-two-shoes again. It's too easy to, you know, abuse that if done wrong. Right. Uh, plus one extra reason... They tend to take over the story and the fandom because they're, you know, more human, more popular, more badass, I suppose most people think that, and so they tend to have a lot more fans. Right. So I prefer not to use them, honestly. Oh, man. Well, everyone's different. Well, yeah, I mean, well, and every character is too, of course, but, like, right, exactly. you know, it's, it's something that they end up stealing the scene and eventually stealing the hearts of everybody. So, like, instead of liking the main character the most, people like other character the most i mean uh donald mentioned i was it this episode or last one i can't remember now but he mentioned anra the bounty it hunter was this episode type character in his megazoic books and Cortan's the main character but people like anra more because she's just more likable that makes no sense people but, like Cortan like, is fine they just they people well, like right people like again, did you see that thing where like someone literally named their character? Yeah, their, their yeah, yes, I know, I know. It's it's really one of the video cool games. for you. I don't particularly care. But the thing that I oh well notice no. is the thing that I notice is that if you had to force somebody to making a decision, this old adage of mine comes into play. They can't all be your number one. You're saying they got to be their number two? No, I'm saying that somebody. Some character or device or whatever you're ranking has to be number one, and the others cannot be. Right, right. Even 1-1-A one, one doesn't really work. 
So, like, you know, if you're putting somebody on the spot to say who's your favorite character and you can't right. cheat, you can't include the triplets all together, you have to pick <laughs> one. You know, that's kind of the thing. So, you know, well, and I usually say it in reference to, like, uh, seasons of uh, Sentai or Power Rangers, whatever have you, but, right, like, right. They, they can't all be your favorite. Right. Exactly. And generally the and ones that are capable of the ba- of of this stuff, the awesome stuff, the jaw-dropping <laughs> stuff are the ones that rise to the top because those are the things that people like to le- like to see the most. And these characters on top of that have all of the uh, personal filter of lack thereof and so they can <laughs> do whatever they want, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's true, it's all true. <laughs> And that's a, a you know personal choice. I would not. I would definitely do my best to not overexpose a character like this if I right. have one. I don't that because I don't sense. really like writing them. But I try not to keep them on screen the whole time because that way I can share the love with other characters. That's my goal. right. Right. No. Exactly. That said, wow. final editions yes. or other tipperoonies with regard to anti heroes and closing out the set. Yes. Finally. <laughs> that's not that bad. <laughs> but. I love talking about contrast. It's one of the key philosophies I strive towards in my writing, you know? Mm-hmm. In this instance, I believe a good antihero needs a good hero to contrast against. Like, sort of like the opposite of, like, you saying, does, does a hero need an antihero? Maybe not, but I do think an antihero needs a hero. Fair. <laughs> like, if every character is, like, a self-serving asshole, none of them stand apart, you know? They can't all be they can't all be Tony Stark because nobody can be Tony Stark. If yeah, one of them has to be Steve Rogers. So, well, I mean, sure, you can go with that too. They can't all um, be they can't all be Batman. Somebody has to be Martian Manhunter or Blue Beetle or Booster Gold or Green Lantern or Aquaman or or Superman or Wonder using... Woman. Yep. Or um, the Clock King. No, he's a villain. <laughs> That's a villain. What are you going for? Condiment King. You know. Okay. Uh. Anyway. Also a villain. Gentleman Ghost. (laughs) (laughs) The Spectre. Calendar Man. (laughs) The Shadow Knows. Anyway. March (laughs) Harriet. Do you mind getting back to what we were trying to do? (laughs) Okay. Conversely, if every character... I guess this is completely... I need to read my notes before I say... Conversely, if every character is a standard, courageous, noble paragon of justice, none of them will stand apart. Just have a good balance of characters. And don't just divide them into heroes and anti-heroes. There's a spectrum of morality, and everyone's on a different place on it than everyone else, so... Well, okay. There aren't enough places for everybody to be fully different, but there's enough difference in how they treat the world that they aren't identical. Right. You mentioned earlier there aren't just the three types, heroes, villains, anti-heroes, and I also think that's good advice here as well. Like, morality is a spectrum. From one one minute, you could be in a different place on the spectrum because it's evolving, shifting, just like the tides, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, there's, there's a reason why anti-heroes are so popular, I suppose, because they've captured the attention and inspiration of fans and wannabe authors everywhere. But right. please, please, please don't let them assimilate all your other character types in the work. I don't believe an anti-hero should stand alone. Like how the Deadpool movie had to have Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead right. to balance him out a little bit. Right, exactly. One by itself does not make a story. And honestly, that's true with any character type, methinks, regardless of all your Chuck Norris jokes. I heard a Chuck Norris joke recently that was pretty good. All right, what you got? Chuck Norris has been in all the Star Wars movies as the Force. Ah, okay. (laughs) I was literally about to ask you how, but then you delivered the punchline. Okay. Uh, But still, like, one character alone will not make a story. It needs to be counterbalanced by another strongly plotted character, whether this is the villain, whether it's a hero, whether it's somebody murkily in between, whether it's somebody pulling from in the shadows and manipulating all the action, whether it's somebody sending all the warriors into battle, or whether it's the person who's literally holding a helicopter down with one freaking arm and making your jaw go, whoa! Oh, those biceps. You know, you need to have 
a balance between these people. Right, exactly. So don't let them uh, don't let them take over everything. They can't all be like Tony Stark. They can't all be Wolverine. It might be really freaking cool, but at some point it just loses. To use a non superhero example, they can't all be, all be Luke, Legolas. They can't all be Han Solo. I was about to say they can't all be Legolas because that's not a superhero example either. He's not a he's not an antihero. <laughs> he's not an antihero, but I'm just saying that he's a scene stealer, and that's more what I was referencing yeah. in this particular instance. But yes. All right. You're right. Well, they can't all be Boba Fett or Han Solo. Right. Anyway, an hero in Harry Potter. Oh, Snape, I guess. Well, I suppose you could say Snape. That'd probably be the best because he's more an anti-villain, honestly, which could be another well. Episode. Yeah, that's that's true. We didn't talk about anti-villains, but you know, much of the same applies. They're very, very much in Just between. Just in reverse, <laughs> or yeah. inverse, I guess. Inverse, I would, would more prefer the term. But anyway, that's it for this week. That's it for this set. Yeah. So we talked about a lot of things in the last couple of weeks. So if you have questions, please feel free. Let us know. Normally we'd read fan mail, but oh, um, I do have another e- uh, uh, review on Amazon to read if you would like. Oh, sure, please. Not this Amazon, is, uh, is, iTunes. Oh, I'm sorry, is, not iTunes. Apple Podcasts. Okay. <laughs> so here we go, reading the fan mail or reviews or whatever. Please this share. Is, this is from Delta Don. Ooh, like Donald. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the laugh is contagious. Very witty banter between two budding writers as they discuss and act out the trials and tribulations of being an author. Well, thank you, Delta. Thank you very much for that review, Delta. It's awful helpful. Um, I'm curious if you'd elaborate on which laugh you're referring to because I think I've got about seven different laugh types and also Donald gets to laugh too. So My laugh is like a little girl. like. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's probably yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway uh thanks for that review we appreciate it very much uh, all of, all of these things help you know especially because we got a lot of places for you to download this podcast but any place where we can get a review we really do appreciate it yes but if you have questions or like to get in contact with us for any particular reason particularly if you have questions for us to like make into episodes that'd be wonderful yeah exactly. um let us know if you'd like us to read this. I mean, obviously, we make an episode, you'd find out, I suppose. But like, well, eventually, the creative well will run dry. So, if you wanna, if you wanna, let us know what we should do. Uh, we'd love to hear from you too. So, do that. Please go either to the Matthew Donald Creator webpage and the contact there, or you can use your own email system and use this address, Matt D with two T's at MatthewDonaldCreator.com. Obviously, Matt. D by itself refers to both of us. So please yes. specify David or Donald if you want to direct it that way. Also, right. if you're interested in following Donald over there professionally, yes. how do yes. you do that? Follow, follow me at Matthew Don, uh, creator on Facebook, at Matthew Don 64 on Twitter, and Matthew Don 64 on Instagram. Why 64? Well, there are 64 reasons why it's 64. Are you serious? Number one, I like it. Number two, it's my favorite number. And they have number nothing three, to do with the ones we've done already. Okay. Number three, because of my favorite video game consoles as a kid. The number Commodore four, 64. Number four, I enjoy ambiguity. Are you really doing this? Number five, I like oh making God. people guess. Number six. Seriously, I've collected 64, we don't have time for this now. I've collected 64 baseball cards despite never being into baseball in my life. Why number just seven, 64 then? Number seven, because I've won the hearts of 64 beautiful women throughout my life. <laughs> yep. Right. Number eight, because two to the sixth power is my favorite equation. Number nine, oh, really? because it's awesome. Okay. Number ten, because it's fun. Number eleven, because I have a collection of sixty-four seashells from all my visits to the beach. Number twenty. <laughs> You're number so twelve. You oh, this gone. joke's worn out. <laughs> oh, now it's worn out, as opposed to eleven reasons ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Grief. All right. That's, that's anyway. It, Get out of here. All it's right, almost 1 o'clock in the morning us. here. I said I wouldn't say I'm tired, and I'm not tired, except till right now. I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> but I powered through it! Like, and I'd like to think I'm more, like, awake now. Usually at the end of these, I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, we'll keep, keep going. All right. <laughs> Listeners, thanks for tuning into our segment, our set about yes. awesome characters and how to write all that stuff. We'll be From back next week two of the least more. awesome people you can imagine, but we're still better than you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thanks, for holding, thanks for holding on with us through all this episode. And we'll be back next week with some more content from the Ritwit, the show where us two twits have talked about writing and talked ourselves just about out, I believe. Right? Anything else to add? No? 
Um, I get, I realized that I, I made that joke with like, we'll talk about r what we have written again more and they actually uh, will edit in the foghorn. I've just realized it might not work out. So <laughs> based on your schedule. So we'll find, we'll find out if that joke means anything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to figure that out, won't we? The suspense Crap. is killing me. I forgot me. about that. The suspense will get us all. For more on suspense, you should listen to our uh, talk oh, about why God's genre sakes. is so hard to write. I'm Matt Donald. Right. And I'm Matt David. We'll see you next time, listeners. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep on writing. Keep on writing. The...